The 1950s are seen by many as the golden age of education, an era of discipline, morality and academic rigor. But above all, one simple principle underpinned 1950s grammar schools, teaching boys and girls separately. Now 30 modern teenagers, 15 boys and 15 girls, are going back in time to experience 1950s grammar school education for themselves. Kind of worried about giving up all my luxuries. I can't live without chocolate. My mobile phone. My iPod. I'm kind of really worried if the food's going to be disgusting and I'll just starve to death. The most challenging thing for me will probably be discipline, because I don't like teachers. Like most teenagers today, these boys and girls all attend co-ed schools and get taught in mixed classes. So how will they fare when taught separately? In the 1950s, I think girls would do better, even though it tears me up to say it. I think girls are more conscientious of their marks. Girls are really quite nasty and bitchy. Boys kind of like to, to test sort of how far they can push the teachers. Girls are good at shopping and boys are good at map reading. They'll study here at Charles Darwin Grammar School, kitted out to 1950s standards with an emphasis, as the name suggests, on the sciences. The staff are all professional teachers, specially trained in the methods of the period. A far cry from the relaxed approach these kids are used to. Please be upstanding for the headmaster. Would you sit down, please? My name is S.R. War. I should like to draw your attention to our school motto. Solum Supersunt Fortissimi. Only the fittest survive. <laughs> Competition, you will find, is the key word here at Charles Darwin. There will be competition inside the classroom where you'll be taught in single sex forms. Oh. You will be able to concentrate on the learning process without any distraction from pupils of the contrary gender. <laughs> Teaching girls and boys separately in the 1950s had its consequences. Boys tended to excel in maths and the sciences. Well, that wasn't very good, was it, Johnson? We'll try it again. Whilst girls did better in the arts and languages. <laughs> but across the board, they achieved an equal level of academic success. Today, it's a different story. This lot reflect the national trend in which girls now outperform boys by 10%. So, will a month of single-sex classes help the boys to catch up, or will the girls widen the gap? Parents and friends, please leave the hall now. As they enter the harsh world of the 1950s, the boys and girls are immediately segregated. Girls, would you please line up? Boys, stay where you are. They will not only be taught separately, but also eat apart and sleep in different dormitories. From now on, the school rules dictate they may not come within six inches of each other. In Nightingale Dormitory, the girls are about to get their first taste of 1950s life at the hands of Matron. What I want you to do is remove all of your jewellery, your earrings, any form of studs anywhere on your body. After that, you will bring your towel upstairs and we shall remove that muck off your faces. Thank you, Matron. Trust you. <laughs> Right, when you get upstairs to Matron, tell her that she needs to get some of her surgical scissors to that and cut it off, please. Thank you. In place of modern makeup remover, there's carbolic soap. Oh, Matron, do you have anything to get rid of blood sugar flies? 
That's a long piece. Is it life and death to have long nails? Yes, they're my nails. Well, they're coming off. Fingernails and face. Thank you. Nothing gets past the beady eye of housemistress Annabel Bryant. Fingernails and face, thank you. Especially not Ashley Walters eye makeup. Close your eyes, please. Go and get rid of some of that mascara, thank you. Am I going to pick them out? <laughs> we'll see. Okay. I would do it if I if I were you. Okay. The boys are in the charge of housemaster James Williams, who's a stickler for neatness. Some of you are scruffy beyond belief. We do not accept scruffiness at Charles Darwin Grammar. This bunch are for the chop. Oh. They'll get a regulation short back and sides. The moment. You are nothing more than boys. Part of our job at Charles Darwin is to turn you into young men. All right, that's better. At least we can see what you look like now, Jefford. Thank you. Idle fop Brennan Gunston has more to lose than most. Name boy? Uh, Gunston. <laughs> I'm sorry. You are? <laughs> I see we have a problem with speech. I shall instruct you and you shall follow. I ask what your name is, you tell me your surname, followed by Sir, and that is all. Gunston. Name boy. Oh, me, Gunston, sir, that is all. <laughs> <laughs> A common problem amongst today's teenage boys is lack of motivation. Gunston is no exception. Hi, my name is Ronan Gunston, and I'm really laid back. You need to know that I'm lazy and that I'm not going to do much work. <laughs> I think I might be a C student or I should be an A student, which isn't too good. I don't think he really knows what's coming. I don't think he understands how much work he will have to do. My granny's told me that there's no way that I'll be able to cope with it. But I reckon no way is 1950s schooling going to be any worse than what what we've got at the moment. I think we'll make sure that this is a really short haircut. Oh, Thank you. He looks like a different kid. No, I think that's fine. A little we less weight on the head. Perhaps your brain will be a little bit more efficient now. Back to your seats. Oh, what? No way. <laughs> Please change into your uniforms and change quickly. 1950s education moulded children to fit into society. How oh, cool is this? <laughs> there was no room for individuality and school uniforms were compulsory. Can you fasten your top button up? Can you do your tie properly? This won't do up because it's too tight. Look, I'm not being strangled. Not at the moment you're not going to be strangled, but if you carry on the way you are doing, I may well do so. And you lose your attitude. It's fucking horrible. <laughs> Did you just swear? swear? I didn't swear. It's just rude, it's disgusting. Man. Look at me, I look like... Oh, the hat looks like a chimney sweep. And... Oh. We've been given this, which, if you look at it, it's like a pumpkin. You look like a right tramp. And I've been given Jesus sandals. Look at these. Oh, I look a failure. Stripped of their 21st century bling, makeup and fashion, it's time for the girls and boys to come face to face at the school photo. Not forgetting the all important six inch rule. No closer than the edge of that chair. Do you understand? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well done. Thank there you. Go. You Come mind, lad. I better watch yourself. Everybody, when we're ready. One, two, three, cheese! It's really weird, the fact that girls and boys are separated. We are completely cut off with the six-inch rule. If you touch them, it's, oh, my God, cooties, or something like that, which is really 21st century. You're used to going around hugging. Yeah, as if, you know, it's something really... Wake up, you numbskulls! 
Just six hours into term and the boys and girls of Charles Darwin Grammar are being thrown straight in at the deep end. Caps off into right-hand pockets. In four weeks' time, they will sit 1950s O-levels. But first, the teachers need to assess how far the pupils have to go to reach the required standard. Right, you may now sit down in your chairs. We're taking three examination papers, biology, chemistry and physics. Half-hour papers, usual examination conditions will apply. Today, most teenagers sit a combined science GCSE. But in the 1950s, grammar school pupils sat separate exams in the three sciences. Biology examination, turn over your papers, you may begin now. The teachers have selected easy O-level questions. In biology, for example, the children must write an essay describing how the human body digests proteins, carbohydrates and fats. Write clearly and legibly, using full sentences and using good English language. In Britain, the 1950s was an age of scientific excellence, so these kids have much to live up to. Back then, science was still seen as glamorous and exciting. It was an era when British scientists built the first nuclear power station, unlocked the secrets of DNA and won eight Nobel Prizes. Today, science is in crisis. Only half the number of students now go on to study the sciences at A-level, and university departments are closing. Science, it seems, is no longer sexy. Our kids have been predicted top grades in their science GCSEs, so will this bunch of high flyers glide through their O-levels or crash and burn? Excuse me, sir. Uh, what does it mean by the fates of glucose production? I can't answer any questions whatsoever. You do your best, okay? Okay, sir. Sorry about that. It's the nation. You will stop writing now. The kids will get their results tomorrow. But for now, there are matters more pressing, with a routine dorm inspection imminent. Under the school rules, 21st century luxuries like deodorant, makeup and chocolate are all banned. In my teddy bear, I have hidden away, if Matron's not in here, I have deodorant, razors, um, moisturiser. Oh, I put a slit in the side of the sanitary towel and then I took out the padding. And then I got some Galaxy, melted it down and made it into strips and put it in cling film and put it inside the sanitary towel. Unluckily for the boys, the housemaster is on the prowl. There's a telltale bar of chocolate under Philip Donald's bed. Donald! Chocolate. Who gave who planted chocolate on me? That's really... Place them on there. Pint-sized Donald needs his food more than most. Hi, I'm Phil Donald. I'm small, but proud. I've got a growth hormone deficiency, so now I just have to inject myself once a day, and I've already grown four inches in like ten months. So Philip's going to have quite a hard time, I think, with the food at this school because he's a very fussy eater. I might have to stash some sweets in something. Hopefully you won't get caught with Bill. In my inside pocket, I have a book. In this book, I keep the names of any of the pupils of this school who deserve detention. Yours will be the first name in the book. Oh, oh no. Over in Nightingale dorm, Matron sends the girls packing. With 20 years' experience of devious teenagers, she has a nose for trouble. How dare they think that they can get one over me? Oh, my goodness me. What is it? I have no idea. It's a catapult. It belongs to the oh, boys. Right. Ah, I found it. A razor. <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased. Why do they think they can get one over on me? After a successful raid, Matron summons the girls back in. She decides to test their honesty. 
In the firing line is Vicky Buxton. Have you got anything? What? what? Have you got anything? No, Major. You haven't. Can you get everything out from underneath your bed? Can you move to the side, please. Everything out, please. Everything out. Surely not. Stay there, quiet. Sneaky Vicky is a martyr to her sweet tooth. Hi, I'm Vicky Buxton and I live here in Lincoln with my family. Mum is a priest vicar at the Lincoln Cathedral and my dad is a pilot so he flies all over the world. So I guess you could say that they both work up there. Vicky will really miss chocolate. That will be one of the things she will definitely miss. Chocolate, oh, something. I guess it's a girl's thing. It must be a girl's thing. <laughs> chocolate, if you say yeah. it, her eyes light up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll often get phone calls from her saying, are you coming back now? Can you stop and get some chocolate? Plus these. OK, I take the blame for everything, miss, but I get really weak without chocolate, so... I've been a matron for a long time. <laughs> oh, my God, girl, you could have come up with Safe in the knowledge there will be no midnight feasts for these girls, Matron orders bedtime. Right, you need to start getting undressed into your pyjamas, please, or night dresses, rather. Hang your dresses up, please. It's harder than I thought it was going to be, it really is. So strict. Already we've sat an exam and it was, like, really, really, really hard. I didn't even know any of the bloody answers. I didn't even know any of the... I just didn't even understand it. I have had thought about leaving, but it's far too early on. It's just first day shudders. It's just not fun at all. Right, gentlemen, into your beds, please. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. I lay my body down to sleep. May angels guard my head and through the hours of darkness keep their watch around my bed. Night-night. Rise and shine, boys. Come on, up you get, all of you. Come on, gentlemen. It's the morning of day two, and the kids are awoken at the ungodly hour of 6 a.m. To make matters worse, the boys have been kept up all night by William Ho's stentorian snoring. But under the cover of darkness, someone got their own back. Oh, <laughs> Donald. That's not good. I sleep above Ho, and Donald sleeps next to me on the top bunk. And we were looking down at him, and he was he was sleeping with his mouth wide open. So he put a bit of toothpaste on his mouth. So, that, but he obviously rolled in it during the night. Then he woke up this morning, and there was toothpaste all in the back of his hair and all over his pillow. Washed, fed, and watered, the pupils head off to class. The girls are the first to get their exam results. Frankly, the results are a complete and utter disgrace. I almost gave up the will to live as I marked these papers. <laughs> and that you find it funny, because quite frankly, two out of 20 is not a laughing matter. Sorry, sir. Get your head out of your hands. I sincerely doubt there's a brain big enough in there to weigh it down to that extent that it needs propping up. The result of your test, would you like to please read it to the group? Zero out of 20. <laughs> You're an idiot, a numbskull, a fool, and that will have to change. The girls' results are disastrous. Based on their scores, all but one of these academic high flyers would have failed their science O-levels. Could you explain to me what that is at the bottom of the paper? <laughs> Although she's predicted an A star in GCSE science, 
Vicky Buxton made a meal of the question on human digestion. A food pipe. <laughs> Give me an alternative name for food pipe. Trachea, sir. Incorrect! <laughs> Believe you me, you start shoveling food down your trachea, you'll so know it, young lady. You'll be choking to death. A complete ignorance of the most basic scientific facts have let the girls down. Esophagus is the term that we use. Food pipe is what a child, a baby, <laughs> is told. The girls have done badly, but the boys have done worse. These marks are out of 20. Multiply it by five and you get your percentage. Headley. Hey! Ho, one. Hooray! Mr. Jefford failed to trouble the scorers. <laughs> It's all very different from the 1950s when boys excelled in science, consistently outperforming girls by 10%. So what's changed? Back then, pupils were expected to learn reams of facts and figures. They will be perpendicular if T1, T2 equals minus 1. But the curriculum was based around practical experiments, and boys enjoyed blowing things up and cutting open small furry animals. Today, lessons are far more theoretical. You see, these questions were written for people with an attention span. Of more than five seconds. Of more than five words. Well, I haven't got that really, so, so I can't. So what we have to do is build that up through training. You'll be doing PT, we're going to be doing brain training, and what will happen is that during the course of your lessons, you will learn to use scientific terminology confidently. The pupils of Charles Darwin will receive four weeks of intensive 1950s tuition in the sciences with a heavy emphasis on the practical. By the end of term, they should be dab hands at dissection, marvels with magnets, and crazy about chemicals. And it all begins now with the boys' first biology lesson. What we have in the tank is a large piece of meat. With death comes destruction and decay. And I'd now like to introduce you to a few friends who are going to help us with this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Williams has designed an experiment to show the boys how maggots aid decomposition. And over the next few weeks, they'll be able to study the life cycle of the housefly at first hand. Do I have a volunteer? I do. What I require you to do is to put your hand in the tank, pick up a handful of maggots, and I then want those maggots on the meat. With pleasure. With pleasure. Off you go, sir. Go on, mate. Eat one. Yeah. I just can't, I just don't know what you're doing. Marvellous. Um, could we not have maggots all over the bench, please? Could we uh, clear those up? Thank you. Why don't you just put the meat in with the maggots? Yeah, there's more maggots in there. Yeah. No complaints from the boys about this 1950s hands on approach. Bring it on. Yeah, yeah have a scoop up from the other end. Whoa. Now then, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. We will revisit the tank periodically to see how things are progressing. From slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails to sugar and spice and all things nice. Ritzman, Morton, Wyville, out the front, please. Come on, here. All you need to do is to put your hand in and pick up some maggots. It's not difficult. If you do it relatively quickly, there's less chance of them crawling up your sleeve. Now, who would like to be first? Ugh. Nice and easy. I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done myself. Oh, just smell it. It smells like rats. The girls refuse to get their hands dirty. Since they won't embrace practical biology, Mr Williams tries a bit of 1950s domestic science. When you become good housewives, you will know not to leave uncovered food in your kitchens. When your husband comes home from work, he does not want anything to have touched that food other than your beautiful hands. Morning lessons over, it's time for lunch. 
for what we're about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Amen. The boys devour the authentic 1950s tucker. But for some reason, the girls have lost their appetite. Maybe the rice pudding brings to mind their recent biology lesson. There was this big, this meat with a big thing of maggots next to it, and we had to twitch them. And they were like, Ugh, squirming around. It's like, Ugh. The science lessons are like completely different. I was expecting so much, like, well, I was expecting a lot of difference, but like getting maggots out, right? I think I got the biggest handful because I've done, I've handled maggots before. That it sounds a bit dodgy. Pay attention! Boys, line up, please, no talking. It's the morning of the third day, and the boys at Charles Darwin Grammar are getting ready for their first lesson with Mr Stanley, the music master. OK, good morning, boys. Good morning. Fifty years ago, singing was an accepted part of the school curriculum. Today, most 16-year-olds have no music lessons at all. Grammar schools in the 1950s sought to instill pupils with a sense of common identity and shared moral values. This ethos was reinforced by the tradition of the school song. But we must sing it with pride, because this represents really everything great about our school. As we strive to be the best. One, two, three. As we strive to be the best. Yes, you do need some work on your pitching. Yeah. Maybe some extra time. <laughs> no. As we strive to be the best, <laughs> oh my God. we must fight to be the rest. And we know the journey is a long one, we're only a strong one, can never claim the prize. So let's dedicate our lives to the brave men who survive. La 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 la. Oh, for goodness sake, I don't know the words, sir. We have just rehearsed this for the last 35 minutes! Yeah. <laughs> and you still do not know the words. No, sir, I don't. You are stupid. Go and sit down. <laughs> Lunchtime, we will be rehearsing. You and I. There's a long way to go before these reluctant performers feel pride in their school song. Now it's the girls' turn. Will they be croakers or crooners? As we strive to be the The girls easily outclass the boys, but more noticeable is their good behaviour. Critics of co-education argue that girls thrive in single-sex classes without the distraction of boys' boisterous antics. But there's an exception to prove every rule. Don't you dare wolf whistle in my class, Victoria Buxton! Get out at once! Unfortunately for the hapless Vicky Buxton, she's been clocked by the headmaster. Why are you standing outside the class? Um, because I whistled. Because you whistled? Yeah. Were you asked to whistle? Um, no, sir. You're being rude, in other words. I wasn't being rude, I was showing appreciation, but he probably took it the wrong way. Well, I shall make further investigation of the circumstances, but I can tell you now, people who get sent out of class in my school, I'm not very happy about it. You understand that, don't you? Yes, right, over there, please, and face the wall. Yes, sir. Detention awaits Vicky Buxton. Unfold your arms. But first, lessons, lessons, and more lessons. Modern teenagers clock up around 28 hours of classes a week. This lot will average 40. 
they need them. Their exam results have exposed some appalling gaps in knowledge. When it comes to physics, the girls are astronomically ignorant. How long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? Um, 24 hours. Wrong! Oh, 360. Do not give me a second answer. This is not a guessing game. Yes, sit. List the planets of the solar system starting with the closest to the sun. Mercury. <laughs> no, no, wait. Um. Sit. Saturn. Sit. I can name them. I Sit. Should... Another lad is struggling to adjust. Ever since he lost his shaggy locks, Brennan Gunston has not stopped moaning and groaning. Now he wants to go home. There's no music. I want to go out for smoke. And I can't. Um, there's not enough food. I'm starving. I feel like shit. Uh, but like, is it, is it, and I look like a prick. Fucking had my hair cut off. Oh. Ever sensitive to the morale of her charges, Matron summons Gunston to her surgery. I've had a letter today. Perhaps you'd like to read it. Mums always come up with the goods, don't they? I understand you've been a little bit unhappy. Go on, Gunston. <coughs> now listen. Listen. Listen to me. Everybody has a wobble every now and again when they come to a new school. No, it's, it's not that. What is it then? Tell me what it is. It's so easy sometimes to throw in the towel and go home. And shall I tell you something? You'll never get this opportunity again to be at a school like this. No, I still, I still really want to go home. Well, I would like you to think about this decision and then come and see me tomorrow morning. No, no, no. I've, I've thought about it long and hard enough. And I want to be out by the end of the day. Off you go to lessons, my boy. I think he's probably a mummy's boy. But I don't think Gunston has given it long enough. And I think that he's, he's thrown in the towel far too quickly. And I tried to explain to him, you know, that once you've walked through the gates, you can't come back. This has, like, properly iced the cake. Uh, it says, and never forget, I love you, and I'm more proud of you than you'd ever want to admit. Brennan Gunston leaves Charles Darwin Grammar, having gained nothing from his time there, apart from a free haircut. He's had a taste of it, he's dipped his foot in the water, it's too cold for him, and he's run back up the sand. Later that night, the boys discover they are one short. Gunston's gone. We really thought it would be the girls first, certainly not Gunston. Everyone's homesick. I'm feeling homesick, but yeah, I wouldn't give up so early. Now there'd be an empty bed beside me. But losing one classmate makes them change their attitude towards another. Do you know, how many people do you know, my like, oh, He's yeah, slightly Geordie, slightly posh English. And slightly Chinese. He's slightly well. Chinese, is that, that's rare. It, it'll, it'll kill that's your mum. rare. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you are brilliant and you're gonna stay. Oh, God, do I have to? Yes, I will. <laughs> I'm gonna stay, no matter what. I'm gonna really, you know, try and spend time with her because I really don't want him to go. He's a really great lad, although he does snore really loudly. I think Ho's, Ho's on the verge of going, but like we're keeping him here because he's like he's a good mate and all. I've got my grip now. I can, I'll live. I can, st I can stand. I stand on two feet. But can Vicar's daughter Vicky Buxton pull her socks up? After being thrown out of music and receiving a number of detentions. The headmaster has summoned her to his study to sing the school song. As we strive to be the best, we must fight to be the rest. And we know the journey is a long one where only the strong one can ever 
win the prize. And may God be always there beside thee, so I'm super sent for to me. Wow, that was very, very good. It was in tune without a piano. Um, I should have to speak to Mr Stanley about your voice. I think we have to get you into the choir. So do you think possibly I could get one of my detentions taken off for you? Pay attention! The boys of Beagle Dorm have already been caught with 21st century contraband. But they haven't learned their lesson. Precious. Cheeky scouser Luke Mills even has a mobile phone. Yeah, because everyone's here. Off. I've got a comb over. <laughs> but Mills' number might be up. Housemaster James Williams has 20 years' experience dealing with mischievous schoolboys. Now then, gentlemen, stand there silently whilst we conduct a search. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen. Oh, he's got loads of it. Oh. I did not know that was there, sir. <laughs> I've handed everything in and I did not know my phone was still in my bag. Luke Mills reckons he can always talk his way out of trouble. My name's Luke Mills and I'd confidently say I'm the smartest person in my school. I definitely think people here respect me from an academic point of view. They look at me and they think, wow, that's really something that he's doing, to, you know, to get those top 90 marks and to get those A stars. Luke is a typical Liverpool lad. He's got that so sort of scouse repartee. He has an answer for everything. I've never met a teacher today that doesn't like me. I've definitely got the gift of the gab. Hope you'll be able to get me way out of trouble. Mills, despite your protestations, you are in serious breach of these school rules. It seems to me the places in this school may be jeopardised by your behaviour tonight. If I got kicked out, I'd be absolutely gutted. I'd, I'd, I'm really enjoying it here now after the initial, you know, home missing thing. And, you know, I've still got a lot, I've still got a lot, of, a lot of things to do in this school. Mills will have to wait until the end of the day before the headmaster decides his fate. But first, the boys and girls are going head to head in a debating competition. We shall see who is better at rhetoric, the boys or the girls. And it is a question of skill, not out shouting. It's about being able to craft your argument. 1950s grammar schools fostered the art of public speaking in extracurricular debating societies. Would somebody like to nominate um, Campbell? I'd like to nominate Donald. Donald. Each team sets about choosing its speakers. The boys opt for democracy. But I think, Donald, you have enough votes there. You've got more than 50%. <laughs> You're debater number one. That's Step it. forward, please. Amen. We have to Thank win against them. them. I know that. The girls take an altogether different approach. We just get together as a group and do it. It's so much easier. Use common sense. I'm a loud mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there are other loud mouths in the group. Ladies, I'm going to count to five. By the time we're close to five, I want to see two groups working on the two. Yeah, so, so one, two, Sam, Single line after me. Best of luck. Do Nightingale Dorm proud. After finally selecting their speakers and rehearsing their arguments, the four orators enter the fray. The balloon debate works on the premise that there is a hot air balloon and it's going down. And in this balloon are four famous people from history. And only one can survive. Each speaker will argue the case for their historical figure to remain in the balloon. The boys are championing two famous scientists, while the girls are advocating two figures from the arts. Today I'm going to be telling you about Mr William Shakespeare, and he's the most famous and the best most playwright in the world. Albert Einstein was the greatest man in the world. He dedicated more of his life to science than anybody else. Everybody knows the tune of I Vote Start which is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Psychology, the most austere neurological science there is, and fathered mainly by who I'm studying today, Sigmund Freud. After each round, the audience votes to eject one speaker from the balloon. The first person to be thrown out of our balloon is Einstein. <laughs> Very soon, it's a two-horse race between Philip Donald and Ashley Walters. 
Seriously, all of you, look around this room now and tell me if you can see one thing that science hasn't helped create. I, I, I challenge you. I, there is nothing. A world without science is not actually the debate because he didn't create science and he wasn't a scientist, he studied the mind. Everything Shakespeare created was created from scratch. Shakespeare, I'm sure he could write me a lovely poem, but yeah. I would prefer someone who could get into my mind, tell me things that I probably never have heard before. Out of your mouth would just come silence if we didn't have Shakespeare because he created one third of our language, so you wouldn't actually be able to debate with me or even talk to Freud, your best friend there. Uh, you wouldn't be able to... <laughs> I don't think that that's a sound argument to base upon who survives this savage balloon dropping. OK. <laughs> the savage balloon dropping, yeah. yeah. Savage. That sentence may have got something that's created by Shakespeare. But I'm going to finish now, because I don't think I need to say anymore. The votes are cast. Who will win? Freud or Shakespeare? With 12 votes... Shakespeare, no. with 16 votes, Freud, so... For modern teenagers unused to public speaking, they've performed with surprising flair. But the result reveals traitors in the girls' camp. I didn't win, and the only reason I didn't win is because two of the girls decided, oh, no, they weren't going to vote for me. They were going to vote for whoever they wanted to vote for and vote for the boys. So much bitching going on and everything. I don't think it's good. I don't feel it's very good, to be honest. The girls are split up into, like, four or five groups and there's, like, severe bitching going on. I'm talking really at each other's throats, I had to say to them. Sorry to go with the scouse stereotype here, but calm down, calm down. But Luke Mills has got his own problems. After pretending he forgot to hand in his mobile phone, he's been summoned to see the headmaster. I hope, I think, he won't, ex he won't you know, expel me, but again, I'll, I can only see when I go in. I don't think there is a smidgen, an iota, a kernel of truth in what you've said. Have I made myself clear? Absolutely, sir. Can I have the truth, please, Mills? Yes, sir. When we arrived, I took out my phone in full intention to use my mobile phone. Thank you, Mills. Thank you very much indeed. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. You've basically been dishonest. You will copy out sections from the Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History. Have you read this book? No, sir. Well, you're about to. On one sheet, Write the Latin, on one sheet, write the English. The headmaster gives Mills two hours' detention and instructs him to go to bed at eight o'clock. It's now ten. What am I talking about? It is not a question. <laughs> Uh-oh. Or matron, matron, smile. Uh, I thought you were meant to be in bed. Did you not understand my instructions when I said to you earlier today, after prep, you were to go to bed? Why aren't you in bed? No good reason, really. Why well, bed? Yes, I understand. Oh, I'm screwed. Next time on That'll Teach Him, Eye-opening lesson. Oh, can I do that? Can I do that? No, I find it's actually out. very difficult to cut into the eyeball. Letters from home stir powerful emotions. And you don't really think about it at all until, until it's actually written down on paper and you can see your mum's handwriting. And the teacher's pet is in the doghouse. Ingram, if you continue to behave in such a manner, it will be not your choice to leave this school, it will be my choice. So do not preempt me.